So we are going live in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening and warm welcome to the third webinar in the leadership series. This program is organized jointly by Indian Orthopedic Association, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, and Indian Academy of Cerebral Palsy. I am Dr. Dhiran Ganjwala, the president of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, along with my colleague, Dr. Rujuta Mehta from Mumbai, will host this session. The first question, why do we need such leadership program? If we look around, we realize that our world has a pressing need for good leaders and the leaders who does good for the society. This demand is there in all the fields at all the level. And to satisfy this need, we initiated this leadership series. The theme of today's session is how to convert challenges into opportunity. In our lives, challenges, obstacles, difficulty are inevitable. But to remain stable in such situation and think positively is an art. And we shall learn from the experienced leaders how to do it effectively. Today, we have three great speakers from the medical field, and all of them are from the different medical field. We have Dr. Mini Bodanwala. She's looking after, she's the CEO of Baria Children Hospital and Maternity Hospital. We have Dr. Venkatesh Prajna, who is an ophthalmologist at Arvind Hai Hospital, Madurai. And we have Dr. Lakdawala, who is very famous for obesity surgery. Now I request Dr. Rujuta Mehta to introduce our faculty formally and to start the session. Over to you, Rujuta. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dhiren Bhai. On behalf of all three associations, I am absolutely delighted to be participating in today's webinar, more so because the people who are speaking today are people who I have witnessed personally bringing about a transformational change, bringing about a dynamic uh, angle to places which were perhaps thought as once might shut down and some people who actually brought about a dynamic change in a field which was not explored and having known both of them personally as a privilege mini madam and mufazal and dr prajna, uh, prajna is really really a humbling experience today so without much further ado i will uh, lay the ground rules Dr. Dhiren Bhai and me are moderating, so we will request the audience to send in your questions to either 98210-24711 on WhatsApp or on 98250-25600. I repeat, 98210-24711 or 98250-25600. We have our own uh, queries, and I'm sure their journeys will inspire you to um, ask more and more questions. So let me formally introduce Mini Magic, as I have known her personally. Dr. Mini Modanwala is the CEO of Navrojji Wadia and Bajar Wadia Hospitals. She has received more than 80 plus awards in her career and still counting for various categories in healthcare organizations. Dr. Mini played a very, very instrumental role in bringing a positive transformation at Wadia Hospitals, showing compassion towards the underprivileged women and children of our nation. She's also the advisor and chairman of Wadia Group for CSR activities to Impact India Foundation, to Modern Education Society, which operates seven colleges in Mumbai and Pune, to Britannia Nutrition Foundation and Sir Ness Wadia Foundation, to cite a few. And she's presently the caretaker of Bombay Dying Manufacturing Limited in a big advisory role. Mini Madam played a major role in re- relief and rehabilitation programs during the COVID-19 pandemic, something which struck us very, very uh, badly. And she really uh, taught all of us how to think differently when it comes to such challenging situations. With Dr. Mini Bodhanwala's efforts, uh, our hospital now proudly hosts the largest NICU in the country with 155 beds and 34 pediatric services and more. We are adding more. She has established pediatric cardiology, complex pediatric surgeries and pediatric orthopedic surgeries, neurology, neurosurgery, nephrology, hematology, bone marrow transplant, just to name a few, and it keeps growing. Dr. Bodhanwala has contributed in a very, very strong way for development of public health in Maharashtra, and she's initiated several projects approved by the government of India. 
a vision of engaging the community together and helping children who suffer from cardiac diseases with the little hearts marathon was a very big turnaround event in the history of the hospital and she also played a key role in establishing several found good foundations for UNDP UNICEF and WHO and hospital on wheels to name a few there is such an exhaustive list of achievements of mini madam i'm sure i wouldn't be able to complete all of them so without much ado i give you ladies and gentlemen the mini magic and for you yourself to witness how the change came about over to you mini madam can we please share your screen Uh, can you hear? Are you able to hear? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, a very good evening to all of you, and a special thanks to Dr. Deren Bai and Dr. Rujita for giving me this opportunity to address everybody. I think, as we all know, who leaders are, leadership is nothing but it's just an influence you create. It's nothing more or nothing less, I should tell you. Leadership is also not a cakewalk. It comes with a lot of challenges, but at the same time, it teaches you how to get over those challenges and make them into a success. And those are some of the stepping stones which I learned in my journey of leadership. Basically, I'm a dental surgeon, as you all know, and I went into administration and into finance and also into public health. Today, I'm here to discuss with you my journey of Wadia Hospitals. As an example, I'm taking the Children's Hospital, which we all know that Bajerbai Wadia Hospital for Children is the largest and the first pediatric hospital established and one of the PP models and it was established in 1929. Currently, we are having, as Rujita said, 525 beds, and we have more than 100 pediatric specialists, and we are providing care to more than two lakh patients on an outpatient basis and more than 30,000 on an inpatient annually. Whereas the Naurachi Vadia is a maternity hospital. Basically, these hospitals are mother and child care hospitals and Naruji Vadia is a 400 bed hospital. When I joined these hospitals, way around in uh, 2012, I would just like to bring to your notice that both these hospitals were functioning from one bed. There was a baby abduction and immediately after the baby abduction, within a week, I was made to join these hospitals on a war footing to streamline the situation in these hospitals. So the challenges when I took over, as I told you in 2012, both the hospitals were operating from one location, had one structure because it was a damaged structure of BJ, we had to shift in 2009. And due to a grade two heritage structure category, we were not getting heritage permission even to repair the hospital, safety of the patients. And also, you know, the employees of the hospital were agitated because of lack of space of working from one hospital together. The other was improving the healthcare facilities, scope of the services getting funding because always these hospitals depend on MCGM as well as government. And till today also the same challenge exists. Yes, but today also we are in a more comfortable situation. When I entered the hospital, the CFO would ring up every month before the salary and he would say, ma'am, there's no money. There's no money. It took me a while to understand the operations of the hospital and change the operations of these hospitals. The hospital was also struggling, as I told you, with a lack of fund. The, they, had, uh, they were understaffed and not only understaffed, there were no equipments. As I remember when I joined, there was no proper NICU. The NICU was just around 19 beds with only oxygen lines and I think only one ventilator working. And I would say that, I mean, that was a difficult situation to handle 
when I joined the hospital and everybody would say, oh, we have an NICU, we have an NICU. And I would think to myself, do you call this an NICU? Nobody would call it an NICU. I had at that time taken up certain after reviewing the situation because it took me more than a month to review the situation because of the baby abduction first we had to deal with that and then review the ground situation we had to stabilize that situation then we came i had to frame my immediate goals which was shifting of uh, by my hospital to the original premises getting funding approvals from heritage committee streamlining the grants from the government partners and also the vendor payments, salaries, streamlining the hospital op operations. Whereas my long-term goals were ensuring affordability, safety for the patients, improving the healthcare facilities, scope of services, managing a positive change in the staff, sustainability, improve PR. When I joined this hospital and the first day, my head told me, please go and meet the employees. Should I come to with you to meet the employees? I said, no. I don't need anybody to come with me. I'm going alone for the meeting with the employees. And yes, I had all the union heads charging on me. But I mean, I had a situation where I was strong enough and I had to tell them that the way you talk to me, I'm going to talk to you the same way. So be careful. They told me, no, within six months, you will leave the hospital. I said, I'm here to stay. I'm not here to leave the hospital. You can do anything. Perhaps you may leave the hospital, but I will not be leaving the hospital. So I had my mindset. I had everything in line. The first day itself, as soon as I saw the behavior of the employees. So my strategies and my in immediate goals were program for engaging companies for funding CSR activities for infrastructure and state of the art regular follow-ups for our funds and ensuring quality and safety performing corrective preventive actions necessary through regular audits. My other immediate goals were increasing the revenue, recruitments, training, and development. I found that the staff also needed a lot of training because I found they were not aware with the current systems which are functioning in today's world. Efficient supply chain management with vendor management evaluation and negotiations at the best Asset light model is what I believed would be an effective model because of the lack of funds. And as you see today, though we may not have the funds, but yes, we have the best of the services and the best of the super specialty equipments are with us. And I think the best of the doctors are with us. And I should salute all the doctors for standing by these hospitals with whatever we have. The long-term uh, goals were achieving accreditation for the hospital, addition of scopes in a well-planned manner in order to accommodate the existing structure, generate the additional revenue, like what we did for the bone marrow, as well as the liver transplant, which we are in the process of going ahead with our first patient, the cardiac surgery. We also had to bring about the awareness of these scopes through certain models because we could not go in for advertising because we were a trust hospital and we had some restraints with government as well as MCGM. Awareness of these scopes. The strategies were implementation. There were no SOPs on ground. Literally, we had to make the SOPs, associate ourselves with various companies, establish partnership with renowned organizations like UNICEF mm -hmm. and all. There was a time when UNICEF and other organizations, reputed organizations, seeing to the reputation of Wadia would not enter. But yes, today we have them as our partners and we are very thankful to our team which works with them. The achievements are, it took a great deal of strategic planning, innovation, hard work and patience to bring around this glory of the hospital. First of all, we had to motivate our staff to do the changes. And once our staff got motivated and started working, there was no end, no stopping, as you can see of today. Today, the hospital, as we see, caters to more than 3 lakh patients. Today, we have got 525 beds. We have all the best doctor nurses with the highest education. We have also vocational courses which are running with us. 
And the hospital is a center for pediatric uh, excellence in pediatric cardiology. Our other achievements are in the field of neurology, as well as uh, neurosurgery, hematoncology, bone marrow transplant, liver transplant, and renal transplants. The management was prompt, proactive enough to get the required equipment and equip each department as well as equip our employees and doctors with the required trainings. Today, we have the largest NICU in the world, which is 155 beds. And yes, we have also a success of treating children weighing 400 grams of birth at birth. What else would you want? We also have a nodal center in Clubfoot. We are the only in Maharashtra. And also, as I told you, the UNICEF for severe acute malnutrition. The hospitals have conducted various camps and yes, today it's on a large scale going on. We also have centers for tuberculosis, HIV, which are undertaken. We have a cath lab. We have all the diagnostic fest uh, facilities which a person could ask for. We have also to top it, received accreditation from the national board. We also have NABL as well as uh, we have the ethics committee, as well as yes, we are pursuing and we may be the first hospital in India to pursue the Ballridge framework of excellence, which is one of its kind in India, which goes beyond accreditation. Our other achievements are in the COVID pandemic. Yes, with a very dedicated team of ours, right from the administration to the labor staff, we have handled a lot and we were the first to diagnose the multi-system inflammatory system syndrome. Thank you. I would like to play a video, but before I play the video, I would just like to point out a few things to you. Yes, why I was able to achieve these in this hospital was because of my passion. I knew what I wanted to achieve. I was innovative. You need to have proper integrity, honesty. You need to be an active listener. You need to have self-confidence. You need to be a visionary. And the best part of it is you need to have a very strong communication system. Your communication system with all your team members is what is required, just not your team members, but also with the environment in which you are, as well as your patients. So that, those are some of the things. The other part which we are something different is we have a process of delegation. We delegate our roles our, and we empower our teams. We look out for, you know, who is the best in doing what, what is the skill they have and empower them. And, you know, we motivate them to move forward. So, I mean, these are some of the things which uh, we have been uh, taking on in these hospitals. And there is a resilience always there for responding to disruptive changes also, as well as you will see that not only me, but it goes down and it percolates down to the team that every person in the team shows an empathy and the craving for learning. So the more you learn, the more you achieve. Now, I would like to just show you a small video because even till today, I'm continuing with certain courses at Harvard where I'm succeeding. So I would just like to show you a small video of this hospital. The health of the child is a power of the nation. Carrying forward for more than nine decades, the philanthropic legacy of the Vadia family in providing quality medical care in a comfortable and convenient environment, the Bajorbai Vadia Hospital for Children, located in the heart of Mumbai in India, brings good health and peace to thousands of patients every day. Believing strongly in the fact that quality health care should not be restricted to only certain sections of the society, the hospital offers state-of-the-art and advanced services for neonatal and pediatric care at affordable costs.
to all sections of the society and sees patients from both India and abroad for medical tourism. Built during a time when children were still considered miniature adults, Vardia Children's is the first dedicated pediatric hospital to be established in India. The generosity and great vision of Sir Ness Vadia and Sir Kasra Vadia will continue to benefit millions in the future as well. Vadia Children's aims to provide healthcare services at par with international standards through preventive, curative, intensive and rehabilitative methods. We at Vadia Children's Hospital believe in patient first. And we also believe that all kids deserve to be happy, healthy and safe. To meet the ever increasing demand for pediatric care, the hospital has undergone a transformation in 2017 with further enhancement of its scope of services to include more than 30 branches in pediatrics and also an increase in the number of patient beds to 525 which caters to more than 13,000 patients annually as inpatients and more than 1 lakh outpatients. In an environment that does its best to keep the spirits of children and the parents high with natural surroundings and brightly painted facilities with their favorite cartoon characters, the children are treated for a wide spectrum of rare and complex conditions at this hospital. With tender care by the staff and each doctor taking a personal interest in every child's health and well-being, the hospital sees its responsibility as much more than just medical treatment. Vardia Children's being a tertiary care center welcomes each and every sick child for therapy irrespective of their socioeconomic strata. The inpatient facility at this hospital comprises of wards, the private rooms, pediatric intensive care units, neonatal intensive care units and cardiac unit. With 200 beds in the neonatal intensive care unit, Bhai Jarbhai Vadia Hospital for Children proudly hosts the largest NICU in India. The NICU has successfully treated babies weighing even less than 650 grams at admission. Neonates with all types of medical and surgical diseases and defects are admitted to the NICU at Vadia Children's. With a success rate of 100% for over 200 surgeries conducted in a short span of 6 months, the recently established cardiac center at Vadia Children's comprises of state-of-the-art infrastructure. The dialysis center at the hospital is also equipped with 6 dialysis machine and is the only center offering a zero-day dialysis in the whole of India. This hospital is also a dedicated center for clubfoot in Maharashtra. The hemato-oncology department of the hospital treats more than 100 patients daily on a day cap basis for chemotherapy and other blood disorders. Vadia Children's is the only hospital in Western India where three complex congenital twins have been operated upon successfully and are now leading a healthy life. All patient care services at Vadia Children's are supported by technologically advanced diagnostic and supportive services that includes radiology, pathology, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, blood bank, nutrition and dietetics. The hospital also has a dedicated clinic for children suffering from multiple disabilities and vision impairment. For its excellence in pediatric services, the Vadia Children's Hospital has received more than 50 prestigious awards and accreditations from all over the world. Vadia Children's offers rehabilitation and family-focused methods for promoting a healthy environment for the child and strives to prevent numerous childhood diseases. In its endeavor to promote healthy lifestyle in children and support its cardiac program, the hospital organizes the Little Hearts Marathon each year where thousands of healthy children participate. And this event has been a grand success 
since its inception in 2014. The contribution through the marathon has saved over 200 babies with cardiac problems so far. As a healthcare organization, the hospital is recognized for having the most satisfied patients with the best possible clinical outcomes. Bhai Jor Bhai Vadya Hospital for Children certainly creates a positive impact on the health care of children in India, helping children live a healthy life. I don't want to play. 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 मज़ा बाद है यक्ता जोतो यक्ता बसतो यक्ता करकतो मतलब I am happy yes I was here for almost forty seven days and they gave her to me in a really you know like healthy and I was sent back home and I'm really happy today that you know she's doing well and they too are very glad that she's doing well देखो देखा नहीं फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम she was in a very serious condition she was nutritionally depleted and she was very serious and uh, we had admitted here for uh, almost one and a half months and um, she, uh, the improvement treatment and everything was very good and she had, a, she had shown a very good improvement. I was born here, so I was, that was always my first choice. Right from the security as well, uh, at by Jair by Wadia, everybody, you know, is there at place. But after my son being born here, I probably think that my grandson and everybody needs to be born here. Uh, the structure of the building, to the cleanliness that is there, to everything you say, even the rooms, even the toilets, that's the most important thing. That confidence that this structure carries for a lot of parents, that hope that it carries is tremendous and they are keeping it up to the us. Thank you very much by Jairvai Wadia for you know, keeping my wife um, and keeping my son fit, fine, happy. I am very happy. I will definitely make sure that my great grandson and my grandsons are born here. That legacy now needs to be created and continued. Well, bravo is, I can certainly say, and every time we see this, we just uh, feel a surge of pride in our chest. So, ma'am, I think let's begin the interaction. And that's what, you know, we want to really derive the wisdom out of what you've uh, created. Let me ask the first question uh, to you this way, that uh, what are the three key attributes you think that a leader should have, the three most important things that a leader should have when facing a challenge? Uh, I think the leader should have, you know, an insight how you can handle the challenge. You should know the complexity. You should be self-confident in handling the challenge. And you should know that, yes, you are going to get over it and you are going to win it. So these are the main attributes which I think a leader should have. So uh, is there a process, ma'am, that you follow something like a SWOT, SWEN, strength, weakness, opportunities, uh, and threats analysis when dealing with a challenge? See, supposing you have a challenge which just crops up, as I told you, it could be like a union challenge or something. Yes, you know something is brewing. You have a plan. So that type does not have a SWOT. It depends on the type of challenge. Yes, but in the other areas, there's always a SWOT. And there's always a pre-thinking of what you have to do because you are aware that this situation is going to come, the situation is going to happen. As you know, you are well aware in Wadia, we are with lack of funds. Mm. How do you think today, still with the lack of funds, you are running a hospital, you have become semi-sustainable. Yes, you don't need too much of the funds, but yes, you do need a part of it. And how do you think you are able to get all the equipment, all the services, all under one roof and the best of faculty? So as an example, this is what I can tell you. Okay, so that is so nice to know. Dhirinbhai, anything yeah. that you want to say at this stage? 
Yeah, madam, like you said that in the beginning of your career at the hospital, uh, when you took over, the hospital was in a very bad shape and uh, there was a union problem. So probably it was the beginning of your career and at that point to have a strength, the internal strength or the confidence is, is very difficult. So what actually gave you the strength at that particular time? It was your upbringing, it was your past uh, experience. What actually gave you the strength? Uh, this was not my first administrative role. I had done previous administrative loans, but yes, this was different. And I had the self-confidence because we had two unions and two communist unions, which are known as very strong unions. And this was the first time I was ha handling a union in Maharashtra. Otherwise, I had handled unions in railways. So it was not that I was not used to handling unions, but I knew how to put them on the ground and pin them down. And yes, today, cheers, we are having it as a you know peaceful situation. Yes, in the middle, two years back, again, they had become very active, but we are able to control it and no damage. And you can say that no work is hampered of patient care. So that is what you require. You can keep fighting, that's something different, but nothing should happen to any patient, employee or visitor, which was our main concern until today, it's our main concern. So Madam, when you say, uh, you know, you kind of said you have to keep fighting. So I think that is one very, very important key thing that a leader needs to have, that to have the will to keep going on. So what I want to ask you is, how do you sustain that effort, which is required to turn a challenge into an opportunity? See, you have to keep motivating yourself. Yes, this is the situation. You will be able to win over it. And as per my experience and my self-confidence, I'm able to win over it because I have a wonderful team with me. I have a team right from the down to the top. And yes, as you are very well aware, I have now delegated most of the responsibilities to the team under me. I have selected a core committee, a core group, and I'm delegating and empowering them. So that is my plus point at present. And uh, what is the potential means? Is there, how do you assess? I mean, I'm sure this is like, I'm trying to, you know, get into your mind and find out how do you assess the potential of uh, opportunity? Everyone recognizes an opportunity, but I think it's only some who can assess the true potential of it. So how do you do that? See, when you go on rounds every day, this is something which you have to keep your third eye open. And that is very important. You see the way people are behaving. You see the way departments are functioning. You see the need, what is needed at that point of time. Register it. Try and, you know, do an analysis yourself. Yet, yes, this is what we require. This is what is needed. This person, like, you know, has the traits to do certain things. So you can use that person in that area. So this is how we move around. Okay. So I think that's important to decide uh, where and how what is needed. And then obviously there is something which is when you, when you have multiple things to attend to, when you have diverse departments and diverse people to deal with, how do you decide priorities? The priority is what is needed at this point of time. And yes, everybody's need is a priority and everybody's needs are handled. But what but is do you necessary? do you make a, a sort of a you know short term list and a long term list or no I don't make a short term list I don't make a long term list I try to see that all gets solved at the same time you have uh, you are a witness to many of our departments many new people coming in with us and many new things happening so if I start you know just prioritizing that no today I will do only this. I may not succeed in that and I, it may be left out and the other parts may suffer. So I don't want any part suffering. Take all as a priority. Just plan how you can get one by one or all together and start functioning. And you have to give these plans to the teams who are below you and get your plans right from top to down implemented. 
today, if you see, if we need a department, we need something. Yes, today the whole hospital comes together. Any department, uh, like any department comes and helps the other department, whether it is manpower, equipment or anything. So that is the plus point, which we have been able to motivate everybody in Wadia Hospital. And the last question from my side, uh, because I think that's uh, more in relationship to the future that we are going to now uh, look at. Self-sustenance versus growth, tremendous growth and expansion. Which do you think is more difficult and how should one be uh, behaving in both situations? And then we'll hand over to Dhiran Bhai, because I'm sure he's really having a lot of questions to ask you. Uh, both go hand in hand. We cannot look at one without the other. Growth can happen, but at the same time, self-sustainability also is happening. As you are aware, we are on our journey of self-sustainability and growth, and we are seeing parallelly both happening. And yes, as I said, the team is very important who you have with you to take these dreams of yours to its you know, heights what you want, because your dreams are your dream, team's dreams. Very, very well said, ma'am. Yes, Dhirin Bhai. Yeah, madam, uh, like the theme of uh, today's session is to convert difficulties or obstacles into opportunities. So from your vast experience, can you give us one example where you have really turned the difficult situation into an opportunity? I have converted uh, many difficult situations into opportunities. The most difficult situation when I joined this hospital was to keep it live and running. So you can see the gates were closing when I joined. Dilapidated structure, nothing over there. I could see only cobwebs. And I should say that people used to come to my room at five o'clock. Yeah, come on, it's time to go home. Please go home and I need to shut the hospital and go. <laughs> so from that situation to what you are seeing is a complete different scenario. So that was the biggest challenge I had. And... Uh... Uh, Dhirinbhai, if, if you may allow me just one more last interjection. Um, the COVID challenge actually overwhelmed all of us. I mean, I personally would vouch for it that for about two to three months, I think none of us knew how to find our own feet. And that is the time when I really saw you keeping yourself completely calm and instead utilize that time to look for future projections. So that one question is still unanswered in my mind as to what made you uh, so positive in a situation where the whole world was crumbling down? Uh, I think uh, in most of the situations in the hospital and even now, whatever the situation may be, I am very calm. And even if I have any issue which I need to deal at my level, I do not air that out to my team. I just tell my team, you have to concentrate on patient care and your work and the remaining, I am sitting here to take control. And I used to tell all my team members that please do not, you know, have any fear of any sort. Go ahead, I'm behind you all. So I have always been backing up my people. Dhirin by yours. Yeah, uh, Madam, if you have a time, then I would like to ask about uh, like your failures. I am sure that all successful leaders have some failure at some point in the life. So can you elaborate something on your failure? I, I know that it's not really like a, a proud moment to tell us about uh, failure, but if you can be uh, like uh, open and tell us about uh, your uh, unsuccessful attempt, then we would be very happy to learn about uh, something from that. Uh, uh, my failure was when I did not get a seat into MBBS and I got a seat into my dental. I wanted to become a cardiologist basically. And that was one of the failures in my life. Yeah. And the second failure when you fail and you think you should get frustrated is when you take an administrator's uh, degree and you feel when you go for a job interview, the person finds that, oh, because you are a lady, will a lady be able to handle this or not? And uh, let me tell you that when I went for this interview of mine, I was interviewed, by the way, for four hours. 
for this hospital. I was interviewed for four hours and the same question kept banging on me that, you know, you are a lady, you have not dealt with a semi-government organization. Will you be able to deal with this? That was one of the times. And then when, you know, I felt that, no, I'm not going to get this. And then I got it. That's it. So it was a failure as well as, you know, you felt frustrated at that time that, oh, because of your sex, you are, you know, being asked so much and questioned so much. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you were able to like uh, make everyone realize that uh, it's not the gender which is important; it's the capability of a person which is important, and that counts at the end of the day. Yeah, so, and I would also say, Dhirenbhai, that don't think women power is less, or rather, <laughs> they cannot do when they can manage a home; they can manage anything. I fully agree with you, and we have a very live example in our association, Rujuta. <laughs> yeah, true, very true. Yeah, very true. So, Mao, I think it has been really amazing to really have a sneak peek into the uh, you know boss's mind, and I think I've thoroughly enjoyed the presentation as well as the film. And we know that Madam has several other commitments even now at this hour. So we are uh, with a heavy heart, okay, to let you go. But I promise you, yeah, they'll mange more and we will do something uh, much more in future. Thank and uh, therein by I would uh, urge you to give a vote of thanks to Madam on behalf of all three associations and then we move on to our uh, next uh, talk. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam. Like uh, from Indian Orthopedic Association, from Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India and Indian Academy of Cerebral Palsy, I would like to think from bottom of our heart that your presence, your message has really give us a good idea about what leadership is. And we really need to inculcate all these qualities which you enumerate in your lecture. And definitely, uh, if we try to develop and build these skills, then probably we will be a better leader in future. So thank you once again for sharing your insight with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dhiranbe. Thank you, Dhiranbe. Um, we can move on to the part two. Dr. Mufusal uh, Lakrawala with us, so we can take uh, his talk first and then we will go to the Dr. Pradna's last. All right. So on behalf of the Indian Academy of Cerebral Palsy, Indian Orthopedic Association and the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, Dr. Mufi is no stranger to POSI because he was one of our keynote speakers for the uh, spouses program for the Silver Jubilee POSICON and certainly no stranger to anybody in Bombay who has uh, especially heard about how much he has done for the COVID pandemic. But being a close friend and uh, a, always a pleasure to interact with him, I think I will take this opportunity to personally thank him for all the work that he's done during the COVID pandemic. And at the same time, take the opportunity to formally introduce him. Dr. Laktawala is a laparoscope PI and bariatric surgeon. He ventured into this field about 20 years back when there was hardly anybody in the city of Bombay really doing it. And at present, he serves as the Director of Surgery Department of General and Minimal Access Surg Surgical Sciences at the Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation and Research Center. He has conducted more than 50,000 laparoscopic surgeries in India in and internationally. For his remarkable achievements over the years, Dr. Lakdawala has been honored with several awards and accolades some of those notable word, uh, ones include the World Educator Award by IFSO in 2019, the Best Surgeon World Award by American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery in 2019. In the wake of the COVID crisis, Dr. Lakravala volunteered his time, skills, and services as an advisor to the MCGM. He went about actually being on the field himself for nine months at a stretch when he had a baby to be welcomed into the family and yet he chose to serve the nation instead. And uh, he and his team of 25 healthcare professionals delivered quality care and treatment to over 10,000 COVID positive patients at the NSCI with complete state-of-the-art facilities. And he still continues as a frontline worker and has been giving uh, his advisor services to the government of Maharashtra and the city of Mumbai. 
and he is also very very blessed in terms of uh, being one of the most successful su surgeons for chronic obesity patients and he has strived selflessly throughout his life besides being a fantastic cricket player uh, absolutely optimistic human being all the while there is nothing more than i can say and hold you uh, myself between you and him ladies and gentlemen i give you dr bofazal laftawala to share his leadership journey with us thank you ruju i can afford to call her ruju because ruju was uh, someone i kept troubling but the great dr rujita mehta uh, who's become this top notch uh, orthopedic surgeon well uh, uh, let me let me start by sharing my slide and I hope you can see it. Well, uh, thank you firstly for this opportunity to be here and to speak to you guys. And uh, my journey has been quite, quite strange, like for most other things. Uh, I, for me, uh, medicine is passion. Uh, it was cricket once upon a time, and then it became uh, medicine. So when it's your passion, I believe that very little do you, uh, kind of can go wrong, right? And then. i was uh, when the prime minister honorable prime minister declared uh, the country lockdown on the 24th of march 2020 i was sitting at home and thinking oh my god where will my next patient come from and then my son said let's play football and i was playing a lot of football with him but that is what i was doing but that calling you know calling was this is the time to put your hand up and step out because this is a journey that uh this chance is not going to come back again in your life i don't know whether i will probably see another pandemic in my life side and that's why this mary oliver is saying that tell me what you want to do with your one wild and precious life that brings me here to to kind of tell you that that is how my journey started that is how i spent 6 months of my life completely uh with my n95 mask and and to tell you honestly this n95 mask has probably protected me and uh, so far touch wood i have not ever contracted the virus despite being around more than 10000 or people intubating them my shield falling off in front of them and uh, not not uh, until around 6 months back did i get my first dose of my vaccine so it's been a great journey uh, but it's been a lot of learning as well so i believe that, that the teacher of the year award has to go to covid-19 all right it has taught us all how to relive life uh, how to get back to simplicity how to get back to spirituality for all of us who believe that we had to be on a on a plane every other week or that the world would not learn if i was not on that plane teaching the rest of the world it's a crash landing to reality and all of us have been brought down to our knees to say the world still running people are still managing with zoom or without uh, managing to teach people and stuff like that so this is the time to spend with your family with your loved ones and unfortunately or fortunately i probably spent this time only away from my loved ones so uh, i want to put out that i am a surgeon i had almost little or no knowledge about the coronavirus when it first started in wuhan in china in 2019 i actually have friends very close friends in china because a lot of the surgeons i am uh, an honorary surgeon to the chinese national society and uh, i tried to send them n95 masks at that point of time because they were really struggling uh, i realized that india had stopped export of n95 masks to china so then i tried to send them uh, through dubai i uh, i was operating in dubai and i took these masks there I, it was around 500 masks which i wanted to send out of dubai and when i went to dubai i realized that just a day prior dubai had stopped export of these masks and were allowing only two masks to get out so then how do i do then i spoke to another friend in oman and finally i managed to send it from oman little did i know that very soon this would come knocking on our very own shores and i would be the one who would be buying these masks at some insane rate in the beginning when i started this journey like i said the knowledge base of this virus is so little that we in india have tried everything from sunlight to steam to cow dung to yoga to everything and we do know that the only person who's won in this journey is covid and all of us have looked to it the icmr the 
uh, CSIR, the, the WHO, all have given out big stats, which all, if you go to see some of the early uh, advices from these uh, esteemed bodies with very, very respected people on these bodies, you will realize that most of these advices you would laugh at today in the day of the vaccine and various other things. So little was known. The only people who really knew something was the people who stepped out and treated these patients themselves. We did little but to hurt away our migrants. We, 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 uh, stigmatization of this virus was huge. And that is what I, I want to tell you all, that please don't stigmatize, irrespective of whatever happens. I stepped into this battle to, for two main reasons. One was to drive away the fear from people. Uh, I had one old lady who was around 70 years of age. And when she was diagnosed as COVID positive with diabetes, uh, the sirens blazed, the BMC ambulances went to him, got her, it, uh, despite her not agreeing to come, they got her and plumped her into NSCI. And the first thing I did is I wore my PPE, I went and hugged her. And I said, I mitula gari patona. And that I think, uh, kind of set the tone for my the rest of my eight or nine months that I spent in the COVID war. I think stigmatization killed more people during this pandemic than the actual disease itself and the fear of dying of the disease. So from being very, very happy to being this uh, uh, surgeon in scrubs, I got an opportunity and they say that opportunity doesn't always come gift wrap. So I stopped practicing. For nine months, I did not do one single surgery. I gave up all surgery, not a planned thing, but it happened as it came along. And I completely immersed myself into COVID. And that is how I looked. Every single day I would dress up. In the beginning, I would be uh, in these clothes for at least nine to 10 hours. And that time we looked like almost like warriors going out to fight some kind of a war. Well, it also pays to unbelong. And today I am speaking to you because I was one of the guys who stood out and probably said that uh, this virus is your, we didn't know very much about the virus in, in March, 2020. We didn't know who would live, who would die. Today with a recovery rate of 96% and above in India, we are all have enough of knowledge about the coronavirus. We all do know you take monoclonal antibodies, you take vaccines and you'll be fine. But back then you were one, who was out of the crowd. People were very scared to come out. Even our own fraternity, there were lots of people. I asked a lot of my colleagues, please come out and help. And every time, albeit I'm, I have no grudges, but albeit someone gave a new excuse for not stepping out at that point of time. And, and uh, sometimes I felt defeated. Sometimes I felt that that strengthened my resolve, that I had to do something to fight this. And that's how I contributed to G South Out, which was the first red hot zone of India, became my uh, journey for the next nine months. Well, they say that handling pressure is an art that we have to learn. If you want to succeed in life, you have to learn how to handle pressure. And this is something I put out because when the storm comes in and if you say that you are ready and waiting for it, I think that very little that the storm can do to fight you. And that's my journey. Like Ruju said, I had 24 student nurses because I could not have nurses. And I had seven doctors to start with me. There was one surgeon and the rest, one intern and the rest were physiotherapists. And everyone came and said, sir, we are just physiotherapists, occupational therapists. Can we help? And I said, yes, yes, because beggars cannot be choosers. Uh, and, I don't know whether how many of y'all know a lion, Dr. Ashok Mehta, but he was very, very kind to provide these nurses to me. And his nursing institute, uh, nursing teaching college told me, he told me, Mufi, there's a batch of 24 girls who I can lend to you, for, uh, but they, they are all students. They are not qualified nurses. I said, so they are most welcome in this journey. And for the first at least week or so, I remember all these girls were scared. I had promised all their parents that if anyone were to get the virus, it would be me first and them next. And I would go in every single day with them. Some of them have fainted with the PPE because that time we had these PPEs, which were from Taiwan, which were very, very high grade. Uh, some of them have thrown up in their masks and we've had to bring them out. But all in all this journey, I must thank all these brave young girls 
who probably have saved Mumbai because in those early days, this was the largest facility. We were treating 590 patients at that point of time at NSCI. And then, of course, me along the journey, I had Dr. Nita Varti and various senior doctors who joined me into this uh, battle, and they all felt much, much elated uh, having served uh, the country. But also knowing that I had a very small team. So if I had unrealistic expectations of this team, then I would probably land up with a big, big problem. So I had to bridge the, uh, the, the playing field. I had to level the playing field. And that's where I started my journey into multitasking. So I was everything. I would get up at, let's say, eight o'clock in the morning and eventually sleep at four o'clock at night. And this happened for at least seven months of my journey. I, would, I, I was the doctor. I was the intensivist. I was the, the man who went and arranged for funds. I was also the guy who brought in CSR. I was the guy who was handling with government officials. That time, central government officials used to keep coming and visiting us. So it was a multitasking thing, but it was a great journey, and I learned quite a lot. We, I started teaching interns and, and various other people how to intubate because we didn't have the intensivists with us, and, and there were very few coming through. So we taught physiotherapists, occupational therapists, we taught interns and everybody else how to start intubating. I ran these classes uh, so that I, uh, they would know if the time came, God forbid, push comes to shove, they would know how to integrate. They also say that a diamond is just a piece of charcoal and that handles stress exceptionally well. I don't know whether I did really well, but somewhere I believe that something within me changed during this entire journey. You know, this was this was a state of the entire Shamiana, which we built up as an ICU. And something within me told me, let's not start this. I'm not very happy. And the guys who set up this tent said this can stand any storm, any hurricane and various other things. And y'all would know the, the, the two storms that came into Mumbai right in the beginning. And this is what, what really happened. Now, God forbid, if I had moved my patients here, this would have been in every newspaper because in the night of the storm, this place completely broke down. The tent blew up. Uh, this is a picture of me on uh, this side of the screen where I'm, I had got eight patients. And I remember speaking to the municipal commissioner that time. It was completely flooded outside NSCI. He said, Mufi, please move these patients to the next facility. I said, sir, it's flooded completely out. If all these patients are on high oxygen, if I move them, there's a very good chance we'll lose some of them. He said, what do you plan to do? So within a space in NSCI, we moved the oxygen. We connected overnight within the space of two hours. We connected the tubings, oxygen connectors, and we moved all these eight patients inside and we managed to tide the crisis. So I think it was a great journey. We didn't sleep the entire night in moving these patients and we are proud to say that we didn't lose anybody at that point of time. So sometimes life throws you all these various things and you fall down. But I think the time is when you can get up and uh, dust yourself up and say that I'm here to fight this challenge. And that's what you learn from champions. The other important thing and the pressure, like Ruju said, is that was my bed for nine months. That was a, a couch in my clinic, which I slept. The rest of my team all stayed at NSCI. I would come back to my clinic and sleep there. Uh, a lot of my discussions with Mr. Thakre, uh, who now become a, a close friend, happened between one and two at night, when we would think of ideas of how to do much, much more to save people. And then the CIVSENIX would call me between two to four to try and move some stranded patient at that point of time. But the biggest thing I, I think was a, something that I have to apologize to my wife is I was not there during the most tough parts of her pregnancy. And we had twins very soon after, during these uh, kids are now pandemic uh, kids, as we call them, pandemic twins. And my son, I could not come close to him. I would see few glimpses of him here and there. He would dress up in my jackets and my clothes to be the man of the house and uh, entertain his mother and uh, other people at home. And that was the only regret I had that I really missed out on the good time that probably a lot of the fathers would have had with their kids. And I was out there because I, I, when I, uh, did this journey, I didn't know whether I'd come back. I frankly didn't know. 
because in March 2020, we didn't know whether we'd survive. I had heard stories of doctors losing their lives and everything. And I was hoping within hopes that someday I would come back out to see my kids. And today, of course, it's a completely different story. So your only limit is you, I believe. And uh, when I had all these challenges, I thought, how do I overcome it? So I started by going up to the municipal commissioner that time, Mr. Pardeshi, as well as the chief minister, and said that, sir, very soon we'll run out of all facilities in Nair, Sion, KEM. Uh, you'll need to give me a, a medan or something big to set up a facility. And they all thought I was completely crazy. They thought that they still said, chalo, it's go try karne do. And they gave me NSCI. They gave me five days to set up NSCI. And from scratch, we set up NSCI, divided it into various facilities. And that turned out to be the genesis of setting up jumbo facilities all across India. And today, when we look back, I had to then set up an entire guideline. Then came BKC, then came NESCO, then came all the other Mulund and all the other facilities based on this kind of draft document that I had given to Mr. Sanjeev Jaiswal, who was that time uh, AMC uh, city uh, and in charge of all the jumbo facilities in Mumbai city. So this is the, the roadmap on which we set up. We came up with a holding cell concept you would remember in, in April and uh, May that very few beds were available all across Mumbai. People who had all kinds of money still didn't get a bed because either you had to be COVID positive or COVID negative to be admitted to a hospital. So I said that I don't want people to die on the road. So I created an, an open concept in the sense that we kept separated beds and we kept oxygen cylinders and we've taken in diamond merchants, we've taken in people who could buy our hospitals, didn't have a hospital bed. Overnight, we would keep them on oxygen, do the RT-PCR till the report came and then they would find a place in a hospital if they became positive or negative. But we would save their life overnight and that became the backbone of my funding and CSR funding started coming in. And of course, much later, BMC came in and took over the project and then started funding it. Uh, I had to play with uh, artificial intelligence. Well, X-ray is not the best modality to pick up early COVID, and I do admit to that. But at that point of time, how many people's CT scan could you do? In the early days, there were hardly any RT-PCR tests we had. So what I would do is I would do a plain X-ray, then we would put it up on an artificial intelligence model, and they would grade these into high, medium, low. At night, I would sit and see the medium and uh, the high grades, and then move them out. We would not be allowed to do RT-PCR because there were hardly any RT-PCR tests available. But if we, if we suspected that they were X-rays, we would completely move these people out. And that's how the first red zone of Mumbai, G South Ward of Burley, started coming lower and lower in the ranks and very soon was uh, taken over by Dharavi and all as, as the number of positive cases moved. And this model of artificial intelligence, we set up a, a bus in which we kept an X-ray machine and started uh, mass testing everybody. So though not the best modality, uh, like I said, beggars can't be choosers. This is something that we thought would at least pick up 50% of the cases uh, of COVID and we started uh, testing people and bringing them out. Then we thought of non-contact cubicles because like I said, I had only seven doctors. And it was impossible for me to go out and uh, uh, 24 nurses for them to see 589 patients at NSCI dome. So I said the patients need to come to me. And, and when someone is in this kind of white attire, it is very, very, very difficult for uh, patients to recognize you. Patients feel intimidated. You are scared. You are sweating all the way. So I set up these non-contact cubicles where the patient would sit on the positive side the air conditioning inside the uh, our non-contact cubicles was completely separate. So we just sat with an N95 mask and patients could see us, they could talk to us through phones and they would come and measure their, their pulse, BP, saturation, everything, take their medicines. And that's how we started bridging the gap between the number of healthcare professionals versus the number of patients that we had. We would test them out over here. And then I started doing in-bed remote monitoring. So for the for the lot of people who were very, very high risk, I would I would remotely, I would give them these wearable devices and monitor them with the dosies from the bed and monitor their, their BP, their saturation, and then take in my zoom in camera, cameras to do. 
This I would get on my phone. I would get all these indices from these patients, from the saturation to the sleep, to the BP, to the sugars, if they had diabetes. And all this would be monitored by my doctors. And we would, we would then be able to say which patient is serious and which patient is not. So a lot of these uh, markers came into uh, handy. Another thing was this setup of oxygen. So when I first set up and said that I need 70 to 80 liters of oxygen per minute, the engineers in BMC told me that I had miscalculated. And they told the uh, municipal commissioner, sir, ye doctor ne kuch galat kiya hai. Uh, itna oxygen humne Nair sa and KM pucha hai, wo khali kehte hai ke ventilator ke liye bhi 5-6 liter oxygen lagti hai. So I said I need jumbo cylinders. And they luckily trusted me. And that's how we got these jumbo cylinders. These are 1.3 uh, metric cube uh, jumbo cylinders. And we set these up. And this actually was why we didn't see dead bodies all across the place. We didn't see too many numbers of people dying, despite the largest numbers coming out of Maharashtra during the second wave, because we had supplemental oxygen, which we had. And all jumbo facilities had set this up after that and how and how this has saved us only time has told us i had lots of people trolling me on social media saying this guy thinks he's some expert and he's setting up all this he's just spending money we had opposition who came in and said bmc spending money but today uh, it's it's a thing of the past and everyone thinks that that was the idea that probably uh cancer patients well i had my friends from tata who came and told me mufi will you take some cancer patient because Nobody's ready to take us in Tata. We are completely up to our gills and there's nobody ready to take us, uh, take cancer patients. And we had these patients coming from all across India. So we, we were the first ones to accept and we created a small niche area for cancer patients. The Tata team would come and manage them. We had them on Riles tube after cancer surgeries and various other things. So we treated cancer patients as well. We treated full-term uh, pregnant ladies. We treated... Um, uh, all, all stages because Nita Varthi was with us and that's how we managed to take pregnant ladies, we managed to take cancer patients and various other things. And then NSCI Dome, as all of y'all would know, is a rock stadium. There was no other place but to set up these uh, ICUs because I needed ICUs. I, if I had a serious patient, I could not keep moving them to NIRKEM sign. So I set up ICUs in containers. Now, how do I prevent my staff from getting infected? I set up negative isolation in these containers and this became the genesis of the first remotely monitored ICUs. These were all the negative burners, the virus burners that we set up. And then we had remote monitoring. So you had this kind of a, a, a war room kind of setup, and the doctors would sit here and monitor these patients remotely. These are the kind of monitors we had. And today, I am proud to say that we've got a 100-bedded ICU, all thanks to Reliance, which we've set up at NCI. It's the best equipped ICU today in a jumbo facility. We are up and ready if a third wave were to hit us. We've got all these remote monitoring. We've got the latest devices. And I'm thankful to them for helping me support this second. Uh... The other thing is humility. At no point of time, being a surgeon, I realized that it takes a mere seconds to come from hero to zero. And so at no point of time did you think that you were God and you knew everything about COVID. The more you thought you knew about COVID, the lesser you knew. And that's what brought me down to this saying, because I didn't do this for the money. Like I told you, for nine months, I didn't earn a single rupee. Uh, Theodore Bilroth's this saying, the pleasure of a physician is little. And at that point of time, luckily, nobody knew who the physician was treating because we all in white cups. Very soon, because of the news, uh, people got to know me. The gratitude of patients is rare. And I think all of us as doctors will live with this one saying. And even rarer is a material reward. But these things never deter the student who feels the call within him. And like I told you, the calling was within me to go out and help my city because I love my Mumbai. And I thought this was my opportunity to be counted. Uh, well, I did get some degree of praise. I got some of the topmost journalists in India to cover me. A lot of media covered NSCI Dome and it became... Uh, a standalone facility. We had central teams who came and said that, please give us a model. I did speak to the LG and the health minister of Delhi to recommend how this model ran. Uh, the, the honorable home minister then up employed uh, these cameras that we use in these facilities for the facilities in Delhi. And so a lot of this was used. And 
I got a lot of political patronage. I must thank uh, Aditya and the CM and Mr. Pawar for their continuous political patronage for getting this facility up and running and whatever after a certain point we needed, we, we got them all. We did get our share of awards and I am I, I, I'm really thankful for these awards, but that is not the reason why we did this. So I would like to leave you with just this one motto, which I have put up in my clinic. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat these two imposters just the same, if you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings without losing the common touch, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. So every time I feel very elated with this awards, I come crash landing back when I read this. And that's what kept me sane through this whole thing. I'm just so thankful to all these people for helping me out, especially these young, young nurses, young doctors, without whom I probably wouldn't have been speaking to you. A special mention to Aditya because he's now become a close friend, but that time he was a politician. I knew little about and kind of helped me. And thank you to my wife my, uh, and my two twins for having not needed my help uh, at that point of time. And thank you to all the various donors who came out and were kind enough. Uh, thank you to all the patients who trusted me through this journey. Thank you, Ruju, and thank you all for patient listening. Wow, Mufi, I think that was uh, so nice and enlightening to uh, be up close and personal about the entire journey. We always knew Mufi as someone who just goes there and takes charge. So let me bring uh, this question to you. As a leader, do you think it's sufficient to take charge? I think it's easy for a passionate person like you to really get into the swing of things. But do you think it's sufficient to take charge? And what decides uh, that how does a leader take charge of situations? I think, uh, I think if, you, if you are a leader, you are the one who has to take charge, especially when the chips are down, right? When there is credit, that's the time the leader should be the last guy to take credit. His team should be taking the credit. And that's what I would always run away the moment some newspaper would come and I would try to push my team in front. But when the chips were down, like the time of the hurricane, like the time when things were not working, if I had to intubate, I would rush in myself. Like for example, when my wife went into labor, she called me uh, some 20 times. And I couldn't take a phone because I had rushed in to intubate a patient at that point of time. It was eventually Neeta's uh, assistant who drove her to the hospital at that point of time. So that's, that's something that uh, I think as a leader, the, when the chips are down, when the going is really tough, that's when leaders stand out. They have to put their hand up and say, I am here to take the, the blame for everything. Like I, I told them, if you can't save one person in these new ICUs that I've thought of or set up, uh, I will take all the blame for it. But if we save one life, remember that this patient wouldn't have been alive, but, but for you. So think of it that way, put the entire blame onto me. Th say this crazy guy made us do these things. But uh, luckily today that turned out to be really good and we could save so many, so many lives. So I think as a leader, take the onus when the chips are down. That's what I believe. So should I say that it's not, uh, if I infer from this, that it's not sufficient to take charge, but it is important at that point then to lead by example and to also try and focus yourself and tell your team to focus on what is achievable at hand. Would that be a correct conclusion from uh, what you've said? I think you have to be part of the team no leader can be aloof from the team. Because if he, like I told you, for the first 10 hours, I would go in the PPE myself. A 20-something-year-old 20, a 20 -something year old nurse, she cannot be motivated until she sees the boss himself next to her. I could have given orders from outside and that would have never motivated her. But she saw that after eight hours when she could not go to the washroom, she, could not, she had not eaten anything, she had not drunk anything, no water, nothing. Uh, she went back and I was still there. So she said, I can't keep, make an excuse to this guy because he's still inside. He's crazy, but that's it. I think that that is one thing that is important that you should be part of your team. And the other thing, Ruju, what you correctly said is that you should take your team along because you have to know their, their, uh, their, their skill sets, what they, are, what they have and what they not, don't have. Make their mediocrity look very good. 
like a physiotherapist and an occupational therapist eventually looked like a fantastic doctor who saved so many lives right so that is what you know, you should know their their shortcomings and their downfalls but uh, increase and uh, enhance their their good good uh, qualities and that's what you can you should give them that confidence that they can go out and achieve much much more than they are capable of so from what you've just said again i think i would infer that a leader not only knows the potential not only knows the lack of potential but he also bees there and holds their hand and takes them through till they achieve success so i think for a leader it's important to not just be a guide or a finger pointer but to be there with them and see them through you have to start from babysitting you have to then leave them a little alone and then encourage them also and that's how they perform i mean is would that be correct if i infer that from what you said yeah absolutely i think that no leader worth his while would ever leave his pupil or the wards alone at all i think you learn this from the army that the captain is the first guy to take the bullet on his chest i think that's the same thing i think what gave the the parents the courage uh, when i when i asked them their permission to to uh, use their their children for this journey was that there was dr lakravala who said that if there is someone will get the virus first it will be him and that's what guaranteed them so yeah so uh, dr dhiren bhai who is our posi president and very very motivated i mean he was a leader to us in terms of the purpose that he gave us in posi and this beautiful concept of leadership that we came through so i'd like now dr dhiren bhai to ask you some questions Thank you. Like uh, initially, when you started describing and talking about the COVID uh, thing, I thought that uh, your topic is about the leadership, and you are speaking on something else. But uh, as you went through the whole journey of your nine months uh, endeavor, I realized that this was the classic example of leadership. So, like leaders, particularly, they are not actually given a task. but actually you found out that this is where you can really work and you can do something worthwhile and this was really a classic example each example each challenge where like how you converted that into the opportunity was really a learning lesson for us now i just would like to ask you about the role of communication in the leadership so yeah you have a one on one side before covid you are a very successful private practitioner and here you are working more on the philanthropy so how that interaction or the communication with your team differs because at one point you were the boss you are going to pay them here they are doing a service on a charity basis or on a humanitarian ground so how the communication differs in both the situations so when you uh, when you do something for passion when you do something for the calling within i think then you never look at the number of hours that you're working right and that is luckily i was very very blessed to have this entire team and uh, none of them were paid in the beginning later when bmc came in yes they were paid and they are they're being continued to pay uh, even to this day with reliance coming in they've been given a uh, covid uh, allowance as well which is almost double the pay that they get so i think i'm very very happy that they are getting what they deserve uh, today but at that point of time sir uh, you are quite correct the joy about this whole covid fight was that it was nobody knew dr lakravala right there was this guy in white scrubs who was coming and actually going there and uh, a little part that i didn't tell you is that which ruju will tell you i grew up in dongri i grew up very very close to Mr. Ibrahim and and in the next lane there, and uh, I had to use some filmy dialogues when we started uh, uh, the NSCI dome. The first day when we shifted page, people from Podar to here, 160 patients were shifted. Now at that point of time, the ACs were not yet on and uh, the bathrooms are not yet opened, and we moved them. And the central team came, so we didn't have time to distribute all these people. So there was mutiny within all the because most of them were slum people. there was mutiny and they said they said we'll break down everything uh, and hame wapas podar shift kar do so i actually uh, myself and the uh, municipal commissioner we walked in he walked in and said uh, i am sharad dukre i am the municipal assistant municipal commissioner g south kai uh, kai paaje tumhala mala sanga so they all said amala parat jaycha covid i mean podar la parat jaycha 
तो सर ओके पाठतो चला बसेस बाहर सग पाठवा दैट वुड बीन दी एंड ऑफ माई जर्नी दैट वुड बीन दी एंड ऑफ एन एस सी आई टू सो आई सेट सर आप एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर uh, हो मैं डॉक्टर मैं अंदर जाके बात करूँ इस सर डॉक्टर कोई फायदा नहीं है इन लोग को आपकी कदर नहीं है आप फैमिली छोड़ के आए हो इनके लिए सो आई वेंट इन एंड आई वॉज सराउंडेड आई वॉज सराउंडेड बाई हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटी पीपल and the nurses were literally trembling and they were because they they didn't have ppes i was the only guy in ppe that time and uh, it was quite funny because i went and said iska leader kon hai aapki team se leader kon so one guy uh, said ha main hu and one old lady actually came and abused me she said maji shive to la lagel okay if something happens to me you are the person responsible so i had to ignore all that right and i said kali कि इधर गुंडा से फेंक ही है और मैं हूं तुम नहीं हो <laughs> तो अगर आपको जाना है तो मैं छोड़ के जाऊंगा कोई आएगा नहीं डॉक्टर आप लोग सब मरोगे देन आई वेंट टू ईच एंड एवरी बेड एंड आई स्पोक टू देम आई से प्रॉमिस यू दिस बी द बेस्ट फैसिलिटी इन इन मुंबई प्लीज डोंट गो गिव मी जस्ट जस्ट वन नाइट आउट ऑफ दैट हंड्रेड पीपल डिन गो सिक्सटी वेंट एंड ऑल दो सिक्सटी वो मूव द नेक्स्ट डे दीज पीपल सेंड वीडियोज बिकॉज वी प्लेड योगा we we uh, we gave messages from film stars there was ac there there was music there and uh, every morning we would do yoga sessions and four big tvs which we had set up and they said all these video clips to those 60 were moved so we moved 59 of them the leader didn't move sir leader back to every political leader he knew of that please move me back to nsci but the municipal commissioner refused to move him at one point i relented i said sir aane do he said nahi finally he said sir ye suicide kar dega and that day he turned negative because we needed negative to send them out and we managed to send them so there are some journeys i think sometimes you have to take these tough calls you have to behave what you are not in your true inherent personality but that's what i behave i was not dr lakhawala i can't relate this to some people so uh, then mufi i think what i would infer from this is as a leader that it's important to connect to even the ground and it is important to be able to make your point firmly and assertively without being aggressive when the going gets tough the tough do get going but even when you're uh, you know even when you're tough i think it's important to keep that line that you never come across as overbearing but you just stay firmly grounded and say i'm not doing this take it or leave it so i think uh, it's very important how a leader communicates his firmness at such tough times Uh, there's one more thing i think mufi what i wanted to ask you um when you have to make things happen what does a leader really uh, try does he try first to reach out does he try to actually mobilize his own resources or does he try really to organize things if he has to make things happen i think every leader should have a methodical plan he should have various options it should not be only option one because if option 1 fails option 2 has to be ready in the back of his mind he has to have that option ready whether he shares it with his team or not but in he in his own mind he should have that ready and uh, he should back the his resources so he should know his strengths he should know his weaknesses because that's the only way he'll reach his goal and and uh, it he should take it like a journey i think the destination should be an entire he should enjoy the entire journey if you stop enjoying the journey then i think then it always becomes a bore if i stop if i would have stopped enjoying going out and reaching out to covid patients then it would have become a complete bore i was enjoying every single moment i never grumbled if i got 4 hours of sleep that night but but that was it i mean uh, i think the best thing about that is that go out and enjoy your journey whilst you are looking to achieve your goals as a leader make sure that every part of your team every member of your team enjoys that journey they will have their good days they will have their bad days so when they have their bad days take them on the side give them a pat on the back and say you are my only soldier i am dependent only on you when they perform something which you don't want them to do it is your leader's job to put pull them on the side and also uh tell them something that is they might not want to hear but you have to do it because uh, like steve jobs said if you want to sell ice creams you should go out and become an ice cream vendor not a leader yeah and i have something to uh, ask you before we wind up with one last question from me yeah 
Uh, Murphy, you had a like wonderful uh, reach experience of uh, leadership. So now how you are going to take this experience to your uh, original practice? Because ultimately now you will be starting your practice or you must have started your original practice uh, of uh, GI disorders or the obesity surgery. So how this vast experience will help you in your uh, original practice? So it's, it's changed me as a person. It's completely changed my personality as a person. And what I've realized is now is the time for technology. Technology is the only way we can bridge the gap between rural healthcare and urban healthcare. So right now I am working very, very closely with the government to try and uh, create a digital tool to try and bridge this gap. So we are trying to reach, I don't know whether I'll ever be successful, but we are trying very, very hard to uh, create something like a digital stamp for every individual. So let's say someone from a village, today if they come to us, they don't know their history. Someone else, some young kid comes with them, they say, ah, dada la, uh, blood pressure hai, ke wa, khokla hai, ke wa, diabetes hai, but they don't know because they're too old to remember. So we are trying to create a digital imprint of all these people. So every time they come with a QR code or with a fingerprint or something, Anytime they come, they will have their signature, which will carry their entire history of their uh, life in medicine, whichever hospital they go. And we are trying this as a, a pilot project in some of the slums and seeing if it works. We are also trying, like uh, you will see some of the drones that have been used now to prevent malaria and dengue. So these are some of the technological advances that we are I'm working with the BMC to use. Uh, we'll, we'll try and use a lot of artificial intelligence in trying to know which way we will go so that the next time a pandemic of this sort hits us, we would be ready with that. Wow, that's, I mean, absolutely super amazing to know the kind of stuff that technology can do. Well, my question was more related coming back to uh, leadership communication, especially because you worked in the pandemic and had all your challenges which were turned into opportunities. How does one communicate bad news? So I think the human angle, despite all this communication and all always remains there. And how should a leader go around communicating bad news? I think just be honest, be honest as far. And I've known this in my surgical practice. I've known this always. If you're honest, people understand. The moment you try and lie about something, you'd have to keep lying one after the other. And eventually when the truth comes out, you look like a complete buffoon. If you are honest, uh, I know uh, people don't like listening to honesty quite often. Uh, quite often, we, we, we have patients who don't do well despite the best of efforts that we put in. And that's the time to go out and, if you made a mistake, you probably don't have to go out and tell them you made a mistake, but in some way communicate that, yes, this has happened because of the surgery. Admit to that fact. I think then the rest will, because some, sometimes you'll realize that your opponents are waiting for this one gap, because if you tell them, nahi nahi, surgery ke se, why nahi hai? Ye kuch bhi galat nahi hai. and then they go to somebody else, he'll say, Achha, ye kisne surgery ki? and that's it. They will lose complete faith in you. Whereas you say you are human. All of us are prone to making mistakes. Let's hope we make less of them. But I think be honest as far as possible. Take the onus and responsibility. If you're honest, I think little can go wrong. Yeah. But I mean, uh, it's become especially more important in times when the passions are high and during a pandemic. So what, what would be the mantra for a leader? Should you break bad news gently? Uh, should you break it in private? Or should you always have one key person with you when you're breaking private news? I mean, bad news. Sorry. I think you should have people around with you today. Uh, at least for the youngsters, they should have people around because... Uh, uh, emotions are running high and people will love to blame you and not the politicians around for everything that has gone wrong, at least in COVID. If they don't get oxygen, doctor's the easiest and best person to blame. Their, their family doesn't survive even despite the fact that they didn't get that uh, family member to the hospital early enough. You are the only one who's going to bear the brunt and blame for it. But I think eventually we've seen a lot of these videos floating around where people are screaming, shouting, everything. They they eventually will learn. So protect yourself first. I would say, yes, you should have people around. Protect yourself, 
and document everything. In today's day and age, document everything. Every effort you've made, document it. You are not God. You, like I, like I put up in the slide, Oedipus complex should never come to you. You are never going to be God. So you can only try your best. And once you've tried your best, that's it. I mean, there's nothing better. I mean, there was nobody ready to put their hand up and try to save a COVID patient. His family members were running away from him. So, I mean, they've got no excuse uh, against you. Who's, who's volunteered to stay away from family, risked his own life to come out and save. And that's why I, I do believe firmly that I think the governments that are there currently need to recognize the effort that doctors have put in during this pandemic. Had it not been for this pandemic, we would have lost many, many more lives. Had it not been for the doctors of India. I think uh, they've done brilliantly. I think every doctor in India, and I, that's why I'm very, very proud to be part of this fraternity, that uh, everyone, irrespective of whether they're young, old, in any which way, they've put their hands up and said, okay, I will try and help and uh, decrease the morbidity and mortality. Wow, I think splendid thoughts and very honest, candid discussions. I think we are already running out of time. The interaction has been so engaging and we could probably go on all night with as many questions as your journey has been. But like they say, all good things have to come to an end. So uh, on behalf of the Indian Academy of Cerebral Palsy, the IOA, the Indian Orthopedic Association, and the uh, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, and personally from Diren Bhai and me, I think we have learned a lot. What we have learned, I think, from both the leadership interactions is that uh, if a man or a woman can dream it, he can achieve it. If a man or a woman really sets out to do something and does what it takes to make the change and starts living the change, I think both the leaders today have been perfect examples of living and being the change themselves. Then slowly and gradually from where the universe conspires or uh, maybe it's just the flow that uh, nature brings in, things do change for the better. And I think all of us here are there to make that positive change. And let's hope what we've learned from these leaders is imbibed by our audience and all of us in our journeys forwards. And with this wish, I will wish all of y'all are safe, uh, to stay safe, to take care of yourselves. And thank you very, very much, Mufi, for joining us. Thank and you. keep doing the good work. We are all totally, totally proud of you. Thank you. Chakra Rukha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mufi. It was thank you, Zirin Bhai. Thank you, Mufi. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank and you. And thank our audience. I think we've already run out of time. We will have interaction with the Arvinda Institute or, uh, you know, many more eye openers much, much later. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So Ashok, thank you. Bye. Forgot to thank you. Sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thanks.